is serene in summer's chime, and through the snow of winter time. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, heavenly as church bells peal. About 14,000 years ago, the northern ice fields began to rapidly melt, swelling the Susquehanna River with water that descended into Maryland and Virginia, filling the Chesapeake Bay and eventually raising the sea level about 600 feet. Archaeological evidence suggests that Native Americans were present in the Chesapeake Bay region as recent as 9,000 years ago. The first description of the area, however, did not occur until 1607. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, so rich is your history. It was surveyed by Captain Smith, and what he noted is no myth. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, we relive your history. Piloting a small vessel known as a shallop, in 1608, Captain John Smith, with a crew of about a dozen men, sailed and rode up the Chesapeake Bay, providing this description, Heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitation. Here are mountains, hills, plains, valleys, rivers, and brooks, all running most pleasantly into a fair bay. He encountered many Native Americans and, learning a little of their language, was able to communicate and have peaceful countenance. A voyage during the period of July 24th through September 7th, 1608, took him the farthest north where at the Susquehanna River he noted, from the head of the bay to the northwest, the land is mountainous. This was in contrast to the bay area where the texture of the earth in most was lusty and very rich. Such was the southern landside junction of the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay, the future location of Haverty Grace. In 1658, this description was not lost on Godfrey Harmer, a native of Sweden, who appears to have been a land speculator. He obtained 200 acres of land along the Susquehanna River where it confluences with the Chesapeake Bay, naming it Harmer's Town. Immediately afterwards, however, the land grant was assigned to Thomas Stockett, who appears to have been the first white settler on the site of Haver de Grace. Stockett was joined by an indentured servant, George Alsop, who would remain four years afterwards returning to England and publishing A Character of the Province of Maryland. He waxed poetically, describing the area as extraordinarily pleasant and fertile. Paraphrasing, he noted it is pleasant with respect to the multitude of navigable rivers and creeks that conveniently and most profitably reside within the arms of her green, spreading, and delightful woods. These woods produce fruits that maintain and preserve several diversities of animals that range and inhabit here. Also found are almost all sorts of vegetables as well as flowers with their varieties of colors and smells. Pleasant was also used by Alsop to describe the taste of food and the ambiance of a grove of trees, so it should not be a surprise that Baltimore brewed National Bohemian Beer was advertised as from the land of pleasant living. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, so great your hospitality. With fairies cross the river wide, and taverns built on every side. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, so great your hospitality. By 1666, the old post road through Maryland had been established, making it necessary to have a ferry across the Susquehanna River. No doubt, early on. This service was supplied by enterprising individuals and, by 1774, Colonel John Rogers had opened a tavern in what was then called Lower Susquehanna Ferry, now Haverty Grace. Three years later, traveler Ebenezer Hazard stayed there writing, lodged at Rogers at Susquehanna Ferry, a very good house. 
Another visitor in 1796 was Thomas Twining, who probably lodged at Rogers Tavern, reporting it was the best inn I have yet seen in America, neat, clean, and pleasantly situated. We found a good and abundant breakfast for us, consisting of tea, coffee, eggs, and cold meat. The old post road connected the 13 eastern seaboard colonies that allowed better mail communications. This was important as Boston was becoming a teapot of discontent with Great Britain over taxation that would boil over into the Revolutionary War. France took the side of the Americans, whereupon in 1777 Lafayette sailed to America, landing at Savannah, Georgia, making his way to Philadelphia to offer his services to General Washington. He passed through Susquehanna Ferry. According to tradition, he suggested the name Havre de Grace, as it reminded him of the port town of Havre de Grace, France, now called La Havre, on the same river near the English Channel. On September 9, 1781, on his way to Yorktown, Count Rochambeau moved his army south across the Susquehanna River, bivouacking at what his mapmaker identified as Lower Ferry. This area in Havre de Grace is identified by an historic marker as well as a tribute to Rochambeau in the downtown area. By a decade later, in 1792, Robert Young Stokes had acquired much of the land in the emerging village and hired surveyor George Goldsmith Presbury to lay out a town to be called Havre de Grace, consisting of lots numbered 1 to 529, two main streets, later called avenues, bisected the town and were patriotically named Congress and Union. Other streets, such as Franklin, Green, and Washington, documented Revolutionary War figures, while such names as Bourbon Alliance and Lafayette recognized the wartime help of the French. Three years later, in 1795, the Maryland General Assembly incorporated the town, stating it shall be forever hereinafter called and be known by the name of Havre de Grace. In 1799, C.P. Hardicore created a map of the head of the Chesapeake Bay and Susquehanna River with an inset expanding Havre de Grace. To attract investors from Pennsylvania, he named north-south streets towards the west Adams, Juniata, Allegheny, Columbia, Ohio, Lancaster, York, Cumberland, Huntington, and Lycoming. Not forgetting the Great Lakes area, he called the north side east-west streets Superior, Ontario, and Erie. To the south, adjacent to the bay, the east-west streets were termed for Maryland rivers such as the Elk, Wye, St. Michael's, Choptank, and Pocomoke. The sale of the map would produce income for Hardecore, and the prestige garnered by this effort would perhaps attract commissions for additional work. Oh, Haberty Grace, oh, Haberty Grace, you never sought destruction. The British came and burned the town, pillaging homes all around. Oh, Haberty Grace, oh, Haberty Grace, your property faced abduction. During the first decade of the 1800s, the British Navy faced a shortage of sailors and began boarding American merchant ships and kidnapping seamen they claimed should be loyal to the Crown. This was an unlawful practice known as impressment. On June 18, 1812, this and other factors prompted President James Madison to sign a bill authorizing America's second conflict for independence entering into the War of 1812. In an attempt to keep American naval forces scattered, British Commander Rear Admiral Coburn was ordered to attack and destroy Chesapeake Bay locations that contributed to America's war efforts. On the Monday morning of May 3, 1813, the derisively called Winnebago's invaded Havre de Grace and in less than two hours had burned and pillaged most of the town. Some defense had been offered by the militia with cannons at the Potato Battery on Fountain Street, 
but the British returned fire, prompting several defenders to retreat, leaving only the brave John O'Neill. He reported, I loaded the cannon myself without anyone to serve the vent, which you know is very dangerous, and fired her, but she recoiled and ran over my thigh. O'Neill withdrew to the town and fired on the British with his musket, but was captured and taken aboard one of the ships. Through the intervention of his daughter Matilda, he was later released and a marker to his bravery stands along the waterfront today. In recognition of the navigation shoals in the upper Chesapeake Bay around Havre de Grace, in 1827, the federal government constructed a light tower on Concord Point. It was built by local entrepreneur John Donahue and John O'Neill, the celebrated hero of Havre de Grace in the War of 1812, was appointed by President Adams, its first keeper. Oh, Havre de Grace, oh, Havre de Grace, a town of fine industries. In early spring, herring were packed. During the winter, ice was stacked. Oh, Havre de Grace, oh, Havre de Grace, a town of fine industries. Fish in the Chesapeake Bay were ballyhooed by Captain John Smith, who in 1608 wrote in his diary, the attempt by his crew to gather them in for food. He reported there was an abundance of fish lying so thick with their heads above the water, but for the want of nets we attempted to catch them with a frying pan, but we found it was a bad instrument to catch fish with. Migrating herring, finding their way up the bay into the Susquehanna River and its tributaries, were being caught by at least the mid-1700s. According to one writer, by 1760, herring salted at Havre de Grace were packed in barrels and being sold in practically all the eastern colonies. Shipments were made by water and settlers came by overland trail from long distances in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and western Maryland to haul their own supplies back home. The ability to harvest migrating fish underwent a major change in 1820, Asahel Bailey of Havre de Grace produced what would become known as a fishing float, a large wooden raft with living quarters. It was a floating village that could be located where the fish were running, anchored onto the river bottom, and hauled in the bounty that generally lasted over a period of about three to four weeks. By 1843, at the waterfront end of Bourbon Street, there were two so-called rough-and-ready iron furnaces owned by George P. Whitaker of Principio. The furnaces operated until about 1856, when the company was sold at auction, then being renamed the Haver Iron Company, nicknamed Bourbon Furnace. The operation was discontinued in 1868, and seven years later, in 1875, the port deposit granite blocks from the stacks were reused and the foundation walls for a new courthouse in Salisbury, Maryland. By 1860, commercial wintertime ice harvesting from the Susquehanna River was a major business. The blocks of ice would be stored in large buildings with thick, well-insulated walls to reduce their loss by melting. During the warmer months, the ice would be transported by ship to Baltimore and delivered by horse and wagon to residents there and later delivered door-to-door -door by truck in Havre de Grace. By 1907, ice was being manufactured in Havre de Grace, and the ice harvesting industry gradually melted away. Logs floated down the Susquehanna River in rafts were routinely delivered to a Havre de Grace waterfront indentation locally known as the Log Pond. There along Market Street between Girard and Fountain Streets was the saw and planing mill of John E. Dubois which was in operation by 1860. The company provided white and yellow pine lumber, shingles, lath, and an assortment of window sashes, blinds, and doors. It burned in 1883, but was subsequently rebuilt. Sometime prior to 1872, the Maritime Railway Shipbuilding Company was in operation along the Havre de Grace waterfront. The company produced barges, ice transport ships, schooners, and sloop-rigged scows. 
By 1916, the Elkton-based Dybert Brothers, in association with John Connor, established a shipbuilding operation in Havre de Grace, producing large barges for the Northern Transportation Company. Canning in Harford County began about 1866 on a small scale, and by 1873, Stephen J. Seneca in Havre de Grace was packing tomatoes under the Red Cross brand. He also canned corn, peas, and peaches, as well as other fruits, employing 70 people during the busy season, as well as the facility produced tin cans for other packers. Today, the old factory is the home of Seneca Antiques. In 1892, William Painter invented a new disposable bottle cap known as the Crown Cork. That led to the Crown Cork and Seal Company of Baltimore, which would become a major factor in the establishment of the carbonated soft drink industry. This business effectively began in Havre de Grace with Edgar Kelly, who in 1907 initially opened a plant near Concord Point, apparently at the corner of Lewis Street and Strawberry Alley. In 1920, Crown Cork and Seal sold to Kelly the first production model of their Dixie Automatic that revolutionized the filling and capping of soft drinks. After moving to a new facility on Washington Street by 1927, Kelly Beverage Company had filled more than 8 million bottles. By 1919, the Whistle Company, which sold an orange-flavored soft drink, was operating in Havre de Grace, featuring the clever slogan, It will wet your whistle. They later operated out of the former Kelly Washington Street bottling plant, delivering products with trucks. By 1923, Captain Hiram Stanley was bottling Coca-Cola in Havre de Grace at a Franklin Street plant serving as two franchised areas of Harford and Cecil Counties. After selling the business to Colonel J.C. Hebditch, it was relocated to new facilities on Juniata Street and many additional flavors were introduced, including a chocolate drink called Mavis. Eventually, plastic bottles were substituted for the glass ones, but were subsequently banned by the U.S. Federal Food and Drug Administration. In 2010, the Coca-Cola plant was sold to a private individual. Oh, have a grace, oh, have a grace, so rich is your history. It was surveyed by Captain Smith. And what he noted is no myth. Oh, Harry de Grace, oh, Harry de Grace, we relive your history. With its protruding rocks and dangerous rapids, the Susquehanna River was generally considered unnavigable. In 1796, however, a daring miller from Huntingdon, Pennsylvania, piloted a sturdily built flat-bottom boat loaded with the barrels of flour safely down the river to the Havre de Grace area. The flour was reloaded on a shallop and delivered to Baltimore, fetching good prices. Such a craft, known as an ark, was a game-changer. Other goods followed, including logs, lumber, grain, hay, coal, and whiskey, setting the stage for Havre de Grace to become a transportation hub. With the opening of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal in 1829, the arrival of the railroad in 1837, followed by the termination in town of the Susquehanna and Tidewater Canal in 1840. Havre de Grace was geographically positioned for growth and economic prosperity. Steamboats towing barges to Chesapeake City for a trip through the C&D Canal proved profitable. Goods arriving on canal boats were transferred to the railroad or transport ship, and manufactured products from Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Havre de Grace could be sent north via the canal, paralleling the Susquehanna River. The town was at the hubbub of transportation activity and would prosper. This wealth would be reflected in the construction of fine homes and beautiful churches. Oh, Havre de Grace, oh, Havre de Grace, your houses are magnificent, built with the money from your trade, along a street with ample shade. Oh, Havre de Grace, oh, Havre de Grace, your houses are significant. 
Noteworthy dwellings in Havitter Grace span a broad spectrum of time from the late 1700s to the early 1900s and reflect nine different styles that follow. The brick two-and-a-half-story Rogers Tavern at 226 North Washington Street represents the Georgian style. It was built before 1788, and George Washington stayed here several times. Located at 814 South Market Street, this vernacular federal-style structure, known as the Dr. Berthold Jacksteed House, has a foundation of rubble stone and is believed to be one of the oldest houses in Havitter Grace. In 1801, Jean-Baptiste Avalie, formerly of Charleston, South Carolina, built this French colonial-style house, reflecting his family heritage. This stucco-covered brick structure stands at 300 North Union Avenue. Believed to have been built in 1835, or perhaps earlier, the brick Juliana Hall House at 227 South Union Avenue was erected in the Greek Revival style with an entrance front porch supported by columns. The M. Pearl Williams House at 300 Bourbon Street reflects the Gothic Revival style with its peaked gables but may also fit into the category of Carpenter Gothic. Its picket fence adds an additional charm. In 1865, Joseph Silverstein House at 414 Congress Avenue is the only Italianate styled structure in Habitat Grace that is built of brick. It has a grand front porch topped with an attractive railing. Located at 212 Stoke Street in the Henry G. Mellon House, that is a fine example of the Second Empire style, built in 1890, it rests on a coarse ashlar granite foundation and is topped with a mansard roof. The Spencer Silver House is often referred to as a mansion and was built in the Richardsonian Romanesque style in 1896. It is one of the most elegant structures in Havre de Grace and serves as a bed and breakfast. The reigning queen of the Queen Anne style is the Vandiver Mansion at 301 South Union Avenue. Constructed in 1886, today it features boutique lodging and events. Oh, Havre de Grace, oh, Havre de Grace, your churches are heaven sent. Standing so tall along the streets, architecture of towering feats. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, many beliefs they represent. Prior to the establishment of St. John's Episcopal Church, most parishioners of Haverty Grace did not attend church on a regular basis. The existing facilities were too distant for weekly travel, and this resulted in what was jokingly called the match, hatch, and dispatch people who primarily attended church for weddings, baptisms, and funerals. The initial St. John's Episcopal Church began as a chapel along the Old Post Road. After being destroyed by a windstorm, a new facility on the corner of Congress and Union Avenues was underway in 1809, when another windstorm and the British attack in 1813 produced significant delays. It was eventually completed in 1831. The Grace Reformed Episcopal Congregation was formally organized on June 12, 1910, after an irreconcilable difference occurred with St. John's Protestant Episcopal Church. The cornerstone of the church at 560 Fountain Street was laid on September 11, 1910, with the first service being held the following December. The First Baptist Church of Haver de Grace was started as a Sunday school by Professor Robert W. Eubanks in 1887, meeting in the town hall. Later services were held in Willow Theater. The cornerstone of the present Port Deposit Granite structure at 120 South Stokes Street was laid on October 13, 1912. The Havre Grace United Methodist Church at 101 South Union Street was designed by Philadelphia architect William L. Plack and built in 1901 of Port Deposit Granite by E. S. Sentman and Sons. The cornerstone was laid on October 22, 1901, with the church being completed in June the following year. 
The cornerstone for the first St. Patrick's Catholic Church in downtown Havre Grace was set in 1847 and the structure was finished by 1850. The current St. Patrick's located at 615 Congress Avenue dates from after 1907 and presents a rather stately appearance along the streetscape. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, they yearn to pick a winner. Thoroughbreds to win a race, and bets were made to show their place. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, our wallets grew much thinner. Horse racing in Haverty Grace dates back to 1785, but did not become a major attraction until a mile-long track opened in 1912. Thereafter, thoroughbred horse racing got off to a successful start, but the dust from the hoofs of the pounding ponies stirred up a storm cloud of moral concerns about bookies, betting, and scarlet women who follow the gambling crowd. It also attracted some famous racehorses, including Man of War, that won the race in 1920, and later in 1947, and again in 1948. Citation ran at Havre de Grace. The track, however, would eventually close in 1950, with its racing days being transferred to Pimlico. The sport of gunning or wildfowl shooting on the famed Susquehanna Flats thrived during the golden years between 1850 and 1930. It attracted many out-of-town sportsmen and women to gun down thousands of ducks during the legal hunting season of November to April. For eating quality, the famed canvasback topped the list as shooters from all walks of life visited the area, including President Grover Cleveland, the Pierponts, the DuPonts, Babe Ruth, and Miss Little Sure Shot, Andy Oakley. This also propelled Haverda Grace into the spotlight as the home of well-known decoy carvers such as Samuel Treadway Barnes, who was a carpenter and an early carver, along with Charles Nelson Barnard, who probably produced several thousand canvasbacks, redhead, and bluebills. Later, there was James Alexander Currier, who was known for his ducks, as well as geese. More recently, there was Haver de Grace's most famous carver, R. Madison Mitchell. Today, these legendary carvers, along with many others, are celebrated in the Haver de Grace Decoy Museum. Oh, Haver de Grace, oh, Haver de Grace, where folks yearn to be merry. Travelers visited the bay, entertained in every way. Oh, Haverty Grace, oh, Haverty Grace, where all the folks are merry. By 1875, the Haver Cornet Band had been organized and what is believed to have been its successor, the Bayside Cornet Band, was photographed in 1889 at Port Deposit aboard the ferry City Bell. In 1905, the Textile Concert Band was organized. In 1870, Havana Grace had constructed a combination city hall and school that in 1896 was refurbished into the City Opera House. Over the years, the Opera House underwent renovations an improvement until finally in 2017, after a little over $4 million restoration, it reopened as the cultural center at the Opera House.